in, everybody. So I'm thinking of changing the name of the podcast. I'm not real sure. But for now, this, so this could be the very last Warrior Poet Project podcast. Oh, wow. Last one? I mean, it's going to be the same podcast. It's just going to have a different name. Mm. I like changing my name. You know, I used to be Chris. Now I'm Aubrey. You know, used to be Warrior <laughs> Poet Podcast. Now I can be something else. I didn't know that. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So we could change it up. But don't worry. It's going to be the same shit regardless. <laughs> We're here today with two individuals who I've known from a vastly different world who now found themselves in a candlelit environment about to talk about ayahuasca. Mm-hmm. These gentlemen here from Barbell Shrug. What's up? Welcome, Mike and Doug. How you guys doing? Good What's going on, Aubrey? So you guys just got back from Peru. I mean, that's some shit that I do. We got we just got back from Peru. Just yeah, got back. Like at like Fresh. our Hours flight ago. arrived at like 11 or 12 today. And then we immediately we, we went to the hotel, washed up, went over to Paleo FX and then talked about plant medicines. <laughs> and now here you are again talking about it yeah i, I have like a that feeling that we're gonna be talking about it a lot this weekend maybe yeah. forever so yeah it we, tends to come up we're in the fitness industry and we kind of feel some gravitational pull mm-hmm. in that's that great. direction yeah. so and that's how most of these things start they start with a calling you yeah. know you guys i remember you were talking to me about it a year ago or something like that yeah. just like a little mm-hmm. bit kind of dipping your toe in it and then that started the calling and the calling got stronger. And obviously at mm-hmm. a certain point you guys decided to answer the calling and head down. Yeah. Last time we were here, I probably, I probably hadn't had almost any experience with it. And that has completely fucking changed Yeah, in the last year. Yeah, we just went to Peru. We were gone for 10 days and we did, we did one San Pedro and two ayahuasca ceremonies, nice. which were undescribable, like incredible. Be, but we'll um, attempt to do it, I'm sure. <laughs> we will attempt it. The, the, We've already done it once today. The mission of the of the initiative is to describe the ineffable, as Don <laughs> Howard used to say. Like, how do you describe it? But you end up doing it. You get close enough, at least. As close yeah. as the words will allow. Mm. Yeah, but you hear other people describe it and it sets you up. Right. And you're like, all right, I'm not going to have any expectations, <laughs> but you do. Of course. Yeah. Of course. And then uh, you get humbled. Yeah. That's a that's a definitely a tendency of the of the plants. They've been around a long time, and if you come in there all cocksure, like yeah, I got this. That's that's actually how I came to the last set of ceremonies. It was my eighth ceremony of ayahuasca, and I'd done a lot of the plants. I was like, no. man, I got this. Oh no, it's I had, different. I had nothing. Yeah, it ended, it the ended other it. plants don't prepare you <laughs> no. at all. No, they, it, they'll give you enough confidence to go in. Yeah, but that's the only thing they do for you. You never, you never know. The plants, have, the plants have their have their way about them. So, all right. So take us through. You get down, and you actually guys, you guys got to do it in the mountains, which I'm totally a we little were, bit jealous of. Jungle's beautiful. I love mm-hmm. the jungle. Mad love for the jungle. It's like paying the mother a house call, but the mountains suit me way better. Yeah, it was beautiful. It was, it was so beautiful. We're in the, we're in the sacred, sacred valley, valley of Peru. Mm-hmm. Andes Mountains, one of the most, muti- most beautiful mountains in the world in the distance. And especially for the, the San Pedro ceremony. Like, it's oh, yeah. a long all that's day the home ceremony. Of San Pedro. Yeah. So what? That's the home. You know, that's where oh, that yeah? medicine comes from. Comes from Sacred mm-hmm. Valley, comes from the high deserts. Yeah. So because it was such a long dare I say peaceful ceremony, like it, it wasn't nearly as intense as ayahuasca. It's mm-hmm. it's long and it's it's pretty light. You still get a lot of profound realizations, but Really, I was just kind of hanging out all day, just staring at the beauty of the mountains and just soaking in my life. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so San Pedro, a lot of people have heard me talk about it, refer to it as Wachuma, because that mm-hmm. was the original name of the cactus and the, and the process. And then the Catholics came, and because it opens up your heart in such a way that mm-hmm. you feel amazing, they called it San Pedro, because St. Peter guards the pearly gates. So that oh. cactus mm-hmm. is guarding the pearly gates, and when you go and experience it, you're in the place of heaven and that's why the Catholics named it San Pedro and that's kind of the common name. So you did that ceremony first? That was the, I think they did it intentionally first to kind of just prep us Take the for the out. ayahuasca. That's yeah. right. Because like, a lot of people there, we went with a group of 10 people and there was a few people that had very little experience with, with any plant medicine. So I think that was kind of like the, this was a, just a way to ease them into the intensity of the ayahuasca. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it was, it was the the first ceremony that we did for sure. And actually, your yours wasn't mine wasn't intense at all, but yours was even less so. Yeah, I um, <clears throat> I, I definitely didn't get enough of the medicine because <laughs> uh, what as we were describing, I, I I wouldn't say I was disappointed because I still learned a lesson, uh-huh. know, and that's why you're there. But uh, a lot of what I didn't get as as much of a powerful experience as a lot of the others got. Sure. So. I definitely need to go for a second round of watching with just the 
just to, just to really get the full benefit of it. And right. I feel like for whatever reason, I mean, there's a reason why. Um, I don't. I'm not really sure why. Um, maybe it'll reveal itself at some point. But I, uh, I didn't. There was a lot of. I, I think the benefit was for me was sitting there in ceremony. Like mm -hmm. the ceremony was what was important. But uh, the typical feelings I get with plant medicines were not there. Right. So. But I didn't. I didn't have as much, and I had a hard time keeping it down. It's just. It's not easy to keep down. It depends. It depends on the preparation. You know, yeah. I mean, uh, what's really difficult on the digestive system is how much of the fiber from the cactus actually remains in the brew. And if mm -hmm. you decoct mm -hmm. it down and you actually isolate, um, you know, the different components of the plant, it can get easier. Mm -hmm. um, we were fortunate enough to be with one of the last great Wachumeros, which is Don Howard. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that was really special because he has a special medicine that's different than any other medicine really? out there. And there's a couple other people who are on the edge of kind of figuring some things out that I've been kind of okay. introduced to, but it's a lost start. It actually started in this place called Chavin, which was before, you know, BC, like 500 BC was when it was flourishing. And they actually archeologically show a period of 800 years of peace when Chavin was flourishing, because hmm. they would provide Wachuma ceremonies for the masses, for wow. anybody who had come in the area. Hmm. So anybody with disagreements, everybody else, they just drink the Wachuma. And it's one of the only times and places in our barbaric history where there weren't weapons being made, fortresses being built. Everything was like chill yeah. for a little while. And it was based around the, the ceremonies of Wachuma, which is a very, they call it heart opening. And what that means really on a neurochemical level is it's a serotonin boosting mm -hmm. um, substance as well. We should have all our business meetings on Wachuma. <laughs> man, that would solve some shit. <laughs> Although everybody would be like, no, man, you take more. <laughs> like, no, no, you take more. But eventually, you know, you'd end up figuring it out. But that medicine, when done, you know, to its highest level is really, really potent as well. Mm -hmm. Different lessons. It was as valuable to me as the ayahuasca. The first is yeah. this amazing expansion and a revelation of how beautiful the world is and this almost giddy mm -hmm. laughing and playing yeah. on it. and then it gets into these subterranean visionary states mm. and then really you can have an opportunity at the end to really lock into like a community and the people yeah. you're with it feels like tribe yeah. but it's a uh, it's its own it's its own kind of little ball game i definitely need to take a second swing at sure. it sure and so uh, and go and you know if you want to do that go for go for a watch your marrow like a, like go to like the highest level it sounds like you did that with the ayahuasca like yeah, you got like a he uh for mm -hmm. yeah our ayahuasca he had been specializing in that and so, for so long he's you know i believe one of the finest ayahuasca down yeah. there and then i think he took on the wachuma years ago because right. he also found a lot of benefit to it but i don't think he has as much experience there's with very that. few there's very few who have the old ancient way right you know like the ayahuasca tradition is largely unbroken because mm. it's passed down from grandfather to grandson for thousands of years people know that game really well it stayed you know it didn't get broken up because the spanish didn't want to go to the heart of the jungle so they're like Fuck uh. it, we'll leave them we'll leave them doing their business we're not right. going in there right. it's scary as shit in there they're fucking wizards and there's jaguars <laughs> and people with blow darts and we can't find anything and our metal our armor is rusting like fuck it we're out yeah. so ayahuasca got to stay where it was whereas the wachumeros you know they were out practicing in really nice areas like you guys were in in the mountains and right yeah so those those practices got really interrupted mm. uh, so that's why that that art has been largely lost yeah I'm with you on it being very heart opening. Like there was no profound realizations that I had about like the universe, like mm -hmm. you might have in some other, uh, in some other experiences. But I, I feel like I spent most of the day just thinking about the people in my life and about how I need to tell them thank you more often yeah. and show them more appreciation. And like I can see where they feel misunderstood and it's wearing on their, on their motivation and things like that. And I just like remember thinking. You know, multiple times, like I need to call my mom. I need to call <laughs> my other business partners. I need to right. call my friends and just and just say, man, like I don't tell you thank you often enough for all right. of, like the, the the shit that I put you through or like <laughs> or like the the stuff that I ask you to do and I just expect you to do it. But you don't have to do it, but you do it anyway. Like it was all very subtle, but it was. I mean, if I if I just followed through on those thoughts, it could totally change my entire life. Totally, mm -hmm. totally. That's cool. You just need to double your dose. You oh, absolutely. A, you needed a double white yeah. yeah. Crack that thing wide open. Mm. Yeah, the next time I'm going to yeah. go deep. Go deep. Well, you took a lot, but you just had trouble holding it down, right? Yeah, I went for a second round, but after I'd purged the first time, it just, 
Yeah, it we wasn't had happening. A, we did it. I've done Wachuma with Don Howard like five times, and almost nobody perched on his medicine. I need to uh, go see Don Howard then. For Wachuma, he's he's the best. You know, no. he's the he's one of the last master Wachumeros. Is that the that's the uh, that's the guy you, when you guys went down and filmed with, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that whole first documentary is on Wachuma. It's on Sempid. Yeah, yeah, yeah I like forty minutes. Yeah, he did. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right, so then got the Wachuma. You know, you got your heart opened up a little bit. You mm -hmm. got you know got used to ceremony. And mm -hmm. then, madre, papatua, <laughs> ayahuasca. She uh, fucked me up. Yeah, yeah, so we have some here. <laughs> we have some here, and we were going to drink right now. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> yeah, uh, ayahuasca is not that thing that you... Oh, man, I, you want to do that on Friday night? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, no. It's not recreational at all. It's just terrifying no. half the time. <laughs> yeah, I, can't, I can't imagine if someone treating it as a recreational no. uh, plant medicine. Mm. The funny thing is, like, the... Every the more you do it, the more repulsive it is. Even to watch somebody else do it, like yeah. we're making an ayahuasca documentary now, and to even watch myself drink it, I can't even look at the screen. I just, <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> it gets like it gets really weird. Like the first time, you're like, oh, okay, yeah, it wasn't so bad, and then after that, it gets pretty pretty rough because you know what it entails, and it's a mm. hell of a cosmic sleigh ride. <laughs> That's a good way to describe <laughs> it. So. <clears throat> Tell us about some of your experiences. You know, first one, diving in. What happened? How'd it go? Mm -hmm. um, so I went in with uh, some very, uh, I was starting to tell you out in the lobby, is is some very surface level. I, I had like very pinpointed surface level like intentions going in. Uh, I almost don't even remember what they were because it seems so ridiculous. <laughs> you were a different person then. Yeah, it, it seems mm -hmm. so ridiculous to ha had I, if I could go back in time and ask myself, oh, what do you, what are your intentions? Mean? I'd kind of laugh at myself. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, and that's where like having a good ayahuascaro comes in, uh, a good guide comes in handy. Is you know they're very wise. They've seen this play out thousands of times. They they've watched this movie. They watch gringos come down and have ideas <laughs> about oh yeah I want to optimize and maybe tweak my business. Yeah. Like, oh we're gonna tweak your heart. <laughs> you know we're gonna tweak right. your mind. And um, I went in with the intent of. Actually, and this is this is where people who don't have experience with a guide would be like, oh, kind of taken aback was he wanted me to feel the fear of uh, failure, rejection, humiliation. Uh, and because I, if someone would say I feared failure, like if I would ask my friends, hey, do you think I fear failure? They'd say, hell no. You know, I don't fear failure in business. I don't fear mm -hmm. failure in athletics, coaching, whatever. But in personal relationships, I do. Mm -hmm. But that's, I keep myself distracted from that all the time, but I don't know it. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I was like, okay, yeah. I was like, I even the whole day leading up to the ceremony, I was like, I don't know why I'm going to think about fear of failure. It's like he knew something I didn't know mm -hmm. about me. And uh, again, I think he's seen this play out many times over. And I'm sitting there, I'm like, all right, well, I'll just do it. And I go in, put my intentions into the cup. I drink the cup of ayahuasca, and then I let it go. And uh, so for, we did two ceremonies. First ceremony, uh, there was a lot of uh, resistance. I felt like I was trying to go through a really tiny door. <laughs> That's what I call it, is going yeah. through the tiny door. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, uh, and I got through the tiny door and I saw myself as he, the ayahuasca had asked me that day. He asked when the last time you felt like a failure, when was the last time you felt like a failure? I want you to, or the first time as far back as you can go. And I, I went back to like 19 years old. And it's funny as earlier that day or the day before I'd made a comment to somebody about like, we were talking about um, Salvia and they were talking about how that can take you back and relive parts of your life. And I was like, oh, I wouldn't want to do that because I have a lot of disappointment mm. in myself mm -hmm. um, and in my, you know, in my life up to this point. <clears throat> so I found myself at seven years old. I get to the tiny door and I see myself as a seven year old feeling guilty, feeling shame, feeling like I disappointed my parents. And I, and I, put that on myself really sure and I got to talk to myself I was like hey Mike <laughs> it's okay 
yeah. you know, you're only seven. You're yeah. doing a really good job, by the way. Like, yeah. it's, <laughs> you know, like, like, uh, and I was the oldest of five kids. And so I think, I think I put a lot of what was happening with them on myself as well. But I had a lot of guilt around, and I grew up in a church too. And so I had a lot of guilt that around like not being perfect. Mm -hmm. And I, I saw myself at seven years old and I, I had that conversation with myself. And it was like, I wasn't, my seven year old self was like not accepting it. So I rewound all the way back to where I was breastfeeding. Mm -hmm. And I got to like, it was like, I got to see my mom hold me. Mm -hmm. It was the craziest thing. Yeah. Um, and then I got to live I, like, I got to go through every point in my life, pretty much to the age of 15 during the journey. And I got to see every point in which I had disappointed, I felt like I had disappointed people. And I had felt, you know, felt that shame or guilt, whatever you want to call it. And every time I hit a moment where I had that, I would purge. <laughs> and it would physically manifest in my body, in different parts of my body. And I would, every, the first like 10 times I purged, um, you know, after a while, you're just dry heaving. It was 90 minutes. Like, everyone commented after this. Everyone was like, Mike <laughs> can purge like a motherfucker. <laughs> but every single, like, the first 10 times I purged, it was, like, shocking to me. Mm -hmm. Because I had physically manifested this problem. And every time I purged it, I had released it. And there was this big relief. And I remember saying out loud, like, holy shit like i was like shocked that it was gone yeah like i had released it and i remember like i would be on my back and then i would all of a sudden i would feel it coming up and i would hop on my hands and knees purge into the bucket and then i would just like lay on my side and feel relief yeah and then the next the next instance in my life where i felt disappointment would come and i would have it's like i would have battle every single time i had battle after battle after battle for hours and um and I went until like the age of 15. <laughs> like I was trying to clean house. <clears throat> and uh, by the end of all of that, it's like I took a big piece of my life and I shoved it into this box. And this is a visual. I shoved it in this box and this box slammed shut. And then on, and it's written at, right after it shot, shuts is religion. On, on top of the box. And I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> I was like, I, I, there was so much religion growing up that was creating the shame mm. and the guilt. It taught you that paradigm. So what? It taught you that paradigm. Right. The judge paradigm. Yeah. You know, and then someone the, is judging you and you, you learn, oh, God is judging me. I'm judging me now yeah. to try and meet these standards. And it, it flows in through that. And yeah. It's a subtle distinction that a lot of people don't mm. realize. Yeah. And, the box shut and then there's complete darkness and I'm like just kind of like well what am I gonna do now <laughs> I open the box back up and I go in and it's like I pick the things out I had like an inner I had like an instant integration in that moment where I picked the things out of my life that happened that were good I got to go experience the good things in my life at that point I got to keep them the things that still serve me and I got to take pieces of my life because what I had done, what I'd done at this point is really box that up and just never thought about it again, which means I got rid of all the good stuff too. Right. I was hiding the bad stuff for myself, but I, that also meant I was hiding the good stuff. So I got to purge all the bad stuff and then I got to open that box up and pull out all the good things and integrate that into my, my life now. And I think a lot of that just makes me a more whole person for sure. Um, in the beginning, there were lots of black snakes. Everywhere I looked, there was a fucking snake. I would see <laughs> a woman. I'd be like, oh, she's attractive. And we'd move closer together. And then her face would become a black snake. I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> Make the snakes stop. It was, it was awesome. Um, awesomely terrifying. And uh, by the end of the night, um, I, oh, uh, one of the good things that happened, so my, my father passed away six years ago. He committed suicide. And I got to relive the moments, my like favorite moments with him in a very real way. And when you don't see someone, when you don't know that suicide is coming, you don't say goodbye. You don't get the mm -hmm. chance. 
And I actually got to relive like all these positive moments with him, all the moments where he expressed love to me. And then I got to tell him that I loved him and say goodbye. And he got to tell me he loved me and say goodbye. And there was, <laughs> there was such a peace at the end of that and a relief. And that was my biggest regret with him was there was all those things that I wanted to do that I didn't get to do with him. Yeah. And simply just being able to say, I love you for the last time was a huge one. And, um, and that's pretty much how I closed out the first ceremony. Well, you just had about the best time I lost the ceremony <laughs> you could possibly get. I it mean, was, that is like the classic paradigm case of exactly the type of medicine you're looking for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's exactly what I needed. And the thing is, is I went down there thinking I was going to tweak to optimize. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I really cleared up a lot of shit that has probably been fucking me up and I didn't even know. Of course, it. All, that, all those programs running under the surface that you exactly. can't recognize. Yeah, you got know? to rewire the system. And it's cool that you got to make these connections too because one of the things that you will learn, you know, the more you do it is these traumas that happen in your life, all of these things that seem psychological or emotional, they have these physical residue in your body. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons that ayahuasca is so powerful is that undoes things psychically and it undoes things physically you're like squeezing that out of whatever organ or whatever system it's hiding and purging it even sometimes when there's very little fluid coming out right it's like you're purging something out of your body that had been stored in the memory of the fascia or the who knows there where were, it was but it's somewhere in there and you feel like, it you feel like poison's coming out or right or damaged tissue yeah. i remember like throwing like i'd been purging for half an hour and then there was like this really powerful deep thing that I purged. And then like it felt like it, there was a lot of solid stuff that came out that was like cancer. <laughs> it was fucking crazy, man. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty badass, man. I've got an equally crazy second ceremony, but I'll let Doug talk. Yeah, jump, jump, <laughs> jump, 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 jump on it. Because the, the second ceremony definitely builds on the first, but mm -hmm. yeah, I'll take a break. We'll leave him in suspense. <laughs> so... Uh, I felt very prepared going in. Our Iowa Scarrow did a really good job of setting ex expectations, letting me know that you know this is going to be hopefully incredibly powerful and beneficial, but it's not going to be easy at all, uh, which turned out to be <laughs> more than accurate. It's not fun uh, necessarily. Trabajo. It's work. It, it's it's work, man. That that is exactly what it is. So uh, I felt good going in, um, knowing that it was going to be rough uh, at times, at least, and so. Uh, I spent the whole day kind of re rehearsing um, this this mantra that worked out very well for me. You said you had a lot of resistance in your in your mm -hmm. experience. Um, I was rehearsing this thing I learned from a guy named Mark Gaffney. You know Mark Gaffney? Mm -hmm. um, the equation that he had had quoted at one point that I heard from him was that uh, suffering is pain times resistance. Mm -hmm. So I thought throughout this whole thing, I could be in pain and that's okay, but I don't have to suffer because I don't I don't if I don't resist it, then I will be fine. I can be in pain, but I won't have to suffer. Wise. Yeah. So suffering is pain times resistance. And that's, mm -hmm. that's actually really helped me out in, I mean, in a million different areas of life. Sure. You could be in an MMA fight and, and not resist the situation, be present to it. Even if you're getting punched in the face, you don't have to suffer. Even if it hurts, you can just be in pain. Well, that one's easier not to suffer because it forces you to be in the moment. You know, it's these emotional <laughs> yeah. things that are really the case yeah. where you're resisting them and that's what's creating the suffering. Or yeah. even when you're about to get sick, Mm -hmm. Like you think about like, oh, I'm getting sick. Well, you actually don't feel that bad. But just the fact that you're resisting it so hard mm -hmm. makes you fucking miserable. Mm -hmm. Even though it's like a, you're about to get a cold, which is like a minimal amount of pain. Mm -hmm. But the pain you feel is like, oh, that's resistance. It's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. The physical stuff's always been easier for me than the emotional stuff. Yeah, Way easier. Is. Which is which is why I think <laughs> that the work I've been doing lately has been so beneficial because mm -hmm. it's, it's took me into that emotional world and made, and made me work on it. Yep. Absolutely forced me to. And so I felt prepared going in. Um, for me, it seemed that the visuals I got, which were powerful, um, they actually were, they would track my, my physical body. So if I felt great, my visuals were very positive. Like I sat up once it started to kick in, I sat up, I threw up and then I kind of, it looked like I probably, it probably looked like I OD'd. Like I just kind of like my eyes rolled back in my head and I just fell over. And uh, right when I hit the ground, like the angels were flying over to me to like come and take care of me. Mm -hmm. Thousands of angels. It's all white. I'm in the clouds. The angels are coming over to take care of me because now I feel better. And then once I was 
once I was starting to feel like I was going to throw up again, the angels were pushed aside. And then, like you said, the fucking snakes would show back up, the alligators, the, the dragons. It was mostly reptiles, big, sharp teeth. And they would come over really close to me, thousands of them. They would try to intimidate me. And I would have to just sit there and just like remember not to resist. Uh -huh. Like it's painful, it's scary, but don't resist. So it was like this heaven and hell back and forth battle where when I felt good, I was in heaven. When I felt bad and I was going to throw up, I was instantly in hell. At some point, it's like very overwhelmed where I like, I literally thought I was dying. Like I, I quote unquote knew that I wasn't logically, but like I felt like I was dying. Did you accept yeah. it when you get that, got that feeling? A couple of times, no. Like I, Resistant. like when I got to the peak of it, I was like, I was, I was having a lot of trouble sure. not, not resisting that. And, uh, but again, they, they had told us that you might feel at some point like you were dying. So at least I was aware that that was a possibility. Little deaths. Um, That's what <laughs> yeah. ayahuasca brings. Many little deaths. Which, speaking of deaths, is the whole point of this story. So um, right about the time that that I was kind of over being in this experience, like I was, I was having some rough, some rough points and I was thinking to myself, you know, you're lucky to have, have – been able to come down here and, and have this experience. I kind of get it. I, now I know what people are talking about. That's really cool, but I'm ready to be done because this is fucking overwhelming. <laughs> and uh, then I kind of caught myself and I was like, you know what? Like, you're always trying to rush through things. You're always like, I value speed over almost anything. I'm always trying to get to the next thing, get it done. And that's like the whole point of doing psychedelics is to where you can just be present, not try to just get things done and get to the next thing, but right. to like embrace this, your, the situation or the um, experience that you're in and enjoy it, right? And so I convinced myself that nothing lasts forever. It'll be, it'll be done in a little bit. Just enjoy it while you're there, and then you can move on when, when the time comes. And right as, right as I said, nothing lasts forever, my visuals, it's all black. I got my eyes closed. And it's almost like as, I'm, as, I'm, as if I was looking up into the stars, little white dots that are kind of sparkling, gleaming, like stars in the sky. And they, they were... Um, forming this figure of a man these little white dots and he's almost like a godlike figure and he turns to me and he says that's right nothing lasts forever not even your wife and kid and he turns mm -hmm. to my wife and kid he grabs them and he casts them out into the distance as if he's ascending them into heaven right and at this point i, I i'm realizing that i'm watching my son my newborn son who's less than two months old and my wife of less than two years they're dying right in front of me. And I'm having the emotional experience of what that would be like if they were to die right in front of me, like they got hit by a bus. And logically, I knew that they weren't dying. Like I knew they weren't dead. I knew I was in this experience, but emotionally I was having the experience of what it would be like if they did die. And so I'm watching them float off into the, into the distance and I'm, I'm crying like I'm, like I'm having an exorcism. I'm crying so hard. I'm gritting my teeth. I have, I have, I have veins in, in my neck and, and you can see the tendons in my neck and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just like open to the experience and I'm just, I'm crying so hard. I've never cried like this before, you know, watching my wife and kid die. And right about the time they were off into the distance and they were about to disappear, they're almost microscopic. This apparent godlike figure turns to me and he says, but they're not dead yet. They're not actually dead. <laughs> and all the color came back into this black scene. It just came back in like rainbows. Like just all the color came back in like, like it's a celebration. And this godlike figure starts like scolding me. He's like, they're not dead yet. But if they did die, you would regret so many times when you could have hung out with them and you could have showered them with love and you could have appreciated them and you could have made their life better and you didn't. And you did something else and you would have regretted that. But from this point forward, you won't forget this situation. <laughs> from this point forward, you will spend every single possible second of your life with them, showering them with love, showing them appreciation, showing them, you know, feeling gratitude that they're there. Um, not taking them for granted. And, and I was just, I was just hit by this, by this intense moment where I actually felt what it would be like if they did die and all the regret that I would have had. And now I get to live the rest of my life having felt that experience, not just logically knowing if they died, I would be upset. That's different. Like logic doesn't play here. I got to feel what it would be like. And now I get, I get a second chance like they did die but just joking they didn't die I get I get to live the rest of my life knowing what that would be like what a great and I, it's a second chance that how would you get it any other way without something absolutely horrible having to happen right it couldn't it's the near-death experience that didn't have to actually happen right. and didn't have the risk of actual death 
Yeah. yeah. I had a recent, and that's a lesson that you may need to tune up in that lesson and it may come in a sure. slightly different way because I've had similar things, but recently in a, in a ceremony that I had, um, I experienced something similar in which I was realizing that every aspect of creation, everything that is created has with it inherently its own death. So every life inherently contains its own death. That mm -hmm. is the destination. So mm -hmm. everything that you see, everything that's created, every actual thing will be dust at some point. It will be reduced to its yeah. base particles. Mm -hmm. And so looking at life, like a, it's almost like you're celebrating a, a constant funeral. So at that point, I got to really celebrate my own death. Mm -hmm. But it was, a f it was a funeral and it was a celebration. It was like I realized that I'm already dead. Yeah, like I'm dead because I was created. I'm dead also. Right. Well, at least this manifestation of me, whatever happens in the astral beyond and the light body, whatever that that yeah. can be its own thing. But anything in this. So myself and Whitney and my family and they were all dead. They were all already dead because they were created and, and mm -hmm. life inherently contains death. And I was the again, you know, them. you have that you have those tears of how much you appreciate and how much God, I fucking love life and me. I'm alive for now, but I'm going to die. So let's fucking celebrate. And I think that's yeah. something that's really fucked up about the whole, the funeral paradigm that we have in our culture is like, everybody's yeah. supposed to wear black and mourn and be sad. Like yeah. we should constantly be living that funeral and in a celebration. And then when it actually comes, it should be a celebration beyond anything else that we've ever experienced. Like, yeah. hell yeah, you know, this <laughs> thing existed. It got born into existence. And as you found with your father, once something is born into existence, you can find it again in other places. And I've found that many times with my grandmother and many other yeah. different people. Some aspect of them after they've been here and been created will always exist, you know, which is fucking badass. So, so when you die, what do you want your funeral to look like? What do you want people to be doing? Man, I want it to be a celebration of everything that I really love. What do I love? I love dancing. I love like working out and competing. I want the playlist. I want like, yeah, <laughs> I want like people taking ayahuasca. I want people, I want it like full on out. Like you want to know about Aubrey's life here. Here's two weeks and there you go. do all the shit that he loved. Like eat great, do ceremony, you know, play, have sex, work out, yeah. you know, compete, you know, just fucking to have a little taste of, of what it was to you know what this manifestation of a force here on earth was while it was while it existed that would that would be the way to do it yeah because i'm i'm gonna exist in some other form or another it's nothing to mourn you know so celebrate how it was translated in this three-dimensional space that we got to we got to experience mm -hmm. that's the way to do it and that's only night one for you guys this is awesome like i hear a lot of stories and it's like yeah that was pretty cool well, but Funny, we had, like, we're down there with 10 people and like I was one of the last people to share for the integration session the next day. And I think having an integration section or session the next day is extremely important. Mm -hmm. And I heard other people's stories and then I, I was one of the last people to go. And I was like, shit. Like the first thing I said was like, <laughs> by the way, I covered a lot of ground. So, like, they were like, and then they're like, okay, whatever. And then I told that and they were like, shit, you did. You did yeah. cover a lot of ground. Yeah. It comes it comes when you're ready, you know, and, and a lot yeah. of people have a lot of expectations and they get frustrated with that. And that we mentioned that outside a little bit, but mm -hmm. whatever you need, it'll come when you're ready. Yeah. You know, when you're ready to take those steps, when you're ready to not resist, when you're ready to open that box back up and you're ready to take these. There's an act of free will in all of this stuff when you're ready to accept, you know, this death. A lot of times people think it just totally happens to you. It does in some way it'll lead you but there's always a place where you can decide yeah you know and decide because it, it gives you for like free will is this thread that runs through everything else when you dematerialize everything else free will is something that never leaves and it actually gets stronger like the deeper the deeper the layer of the onion you go oh and yeah so that's something that's really really sacred that we have you know it's like free will and time you know, it's like you can't you can't avoid those for very long. You can get rid of them for a minute and store them a little bit, but no. ultimately they're going to remain. So night two, let's let's jump in. Let's see what else this the plan had in store. Oh geez, night two. Go night for it. night two is like I experienced more resistance on night two than I did on night one, which was really surprising because I knew what to expect, and maybe that's why. Mm. <laughs> it's like I knew I knew the potential, like. And as soon as night one was done, I was thinking, I'm, I don't want to do this again. But by noon the next day, when we were going to do it again, it, uh, 
it was obvious that I was ready to go again because mm -hmm. I knew that there was more to uncover, more to learn. <clears throat> and, you know, I was kept, I was reminded over and over again, your second, ex you know, no experience is ever the same. It's always going to be completely different. Yep. And I was, but I was still like, oh man, I don't know if I want to do the snakes again. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was like all that stuff. And the second time I went in, I felt like there was somebody guiding me the whole time and like, like someone holding me male or female um it was I, sometimes they don't it's hard to it's tell hard, but it's sometimes it's really distinct it's hard to say no it wasn't a distinct thing yeah um but it wasn't it was like a it was like i like i'd never been held by this entity before mm -hmm. and it wasn't physically at all sure. um and i remember kind of trying to go through that small door again I'm trying to get through that small door. I'm like, how am I going to get through this door? And then there's, there's me, there's me trying to get through this door. And then there's another me like standing there with my arms crossed, shaking my head. Now I was like, I actually visually got to see me resisting. <laughs> it was like me going, no, nope, not doing it. Last, you know, last time we did this, it was not enjoyable one bit. Uh, and then there's another me, which is like me, me going, Hey dude, Stop resisting. You yeah. know that you're causing all this suffering right now. <laughs> like it was like this conversation I'm having with, there's like three of me and uh, I'm having this conversation. And I finally, <clears throat> I'm, during this conversation, I mean, this is peaking really hard and I'm, it's this really deep struggle. And all of a sudden I'm like, I have got to get outside. I, and I mean, there was, it was overwhelming. I get up on my hands and knees and I, because after the first night, we implemented a you can't stand up rule because some dude took a face plant into the center of the room. <laughs> Whoops. Yeah. Love you, Keith. Uh. <laughs> he got a couple stitches like the first the oh, first shit. person that ever got hurt doing a ceremony. Oh, shit. <laughs> Only because he was just standing there for whatever. Yeah. Um, so I crawl over and I'm like, outside. Get me fucking outside. And one of the guys helped me get outside and I, I had to catch my breath. And it was, I was overwhelmed. And once I caught, caught my breath and I spent some time outside and the music was so powerful. And that, yeah, that was the, part the of Icaros, getting outside. The Icaros they play can magnify the intensity to a level that it really, it's a five time, 10 times, 20 times, 100 times multiple, depending, Absolutely. you know, a skilled shaman can take it up mm -hmm. with that environment. So getting outside is like, whoa, my fucking it's voltage, certain, my voltage is exceeding my capacitor yeah. at this point. Certain songs and so you can release like, that. Yeah. Certain songs. It was like the song would come on. I go, oh, here we go again. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had a Chikapa in here to yeah, really bring really me out. Right now. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's one Peruvian guitar song or like a, it's almost like a ukulele or something like that. Really, mm -hmm. it felt like it was pulling me out of me. Mm -hmm. um, so I get through this, I finally get outside and I get through this really tiny door. And <clears throat> I find myself like thinking about spirituality. And it was the first time, you know, I, I intellectualized spirituality is what I was doing. And I was thinking about spiritual things. Here we go. <laughs> Don't mind this. You're gonna make me freak out. <laughs> Don't mind this. Back. Uh, so I'm trying to think about spirituality, and I'm trying to rationalize it. And like I'm really pulling my rational mind around this, this spirituality thing. And there's this struggle. I end up looping. Is kind of what mm -hmm. we had called it. It's like. When you, I'm trying to rationalize something that you can't rationalize. Right. And I end up like trying to rationalize my rationalizations and I end up in this really furious loop. And then all of a sudden. Showing you the failure of words, the failure of the mind. Yeah. Know, to, to yeah. Grasp it's like, concepts. look, man, you don't have to understand everything. Yeah. Just little, experience it. It's like this like little gnome guy pops up out of nowhere. Oh, the little gnome guy. Good. <laughs> it's a friend of his. Yeah. You know the gnome guy? Yeah. yeah there's lots of them. Yeah. Little, so, the little doctors, the little gnomes. So he like pops <laughs> up and he's like, hey, come over here. And I look directly at him and he disappears. Oh, they're always tricky, those little gnomes. Yeah, guys. those fucking gnomes, man. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm trying to find this guy and all of a sudden he unzips this, this like veil. Like it's, it's dark, it's black. He unzips mm -hmm. and kind of opens up 
the zipper so you can look through and it's really green on the inside, like a dark green. He's like, come on in. He didn't say it, but he's kind of gesturing. Sure. But you no, always follow the gnome. Got to. Yeah, got to. <laughs> We're going to show you some what close shit. You know, it's boring outside. <laughs> yeah. you, know, so, you don't tell the gnome like, nah, I'll be back. Like, you follow the gnome. So, I mean, it takes me a while to step all the way through the zipper door. And once I get there, I'm like in this spiritual world. And there's gnomes running around. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, what the fuck, man? This is really weird. I'm like, I am in like the spirit world right now. I'm like, if I'm in the spirit world, where's God? So I start looking for God. Like, Did he show up? He did. Good. Yeah. He, and we're in the mountains. Mm -hmm. And he pops up pops up behind a mountain and I look at him and he kind of like sneaks away he keeps popping up I finally get a good look at him and it's me ah, yeah. ah <laughs> great wisdom yeah <laughs> and during the whole thing I had like this recurring visual of me trying to take spirituality and stuff it in the same box I had put religion in or a similar box and once I realized that you can't you can't do that. It was like it pops out of the box. And I realized that spirituality is everything. You know, it's it's everything. And so I was like, this is, and you can't understand it all. You can't rationalize it. But you found out where to look for it. Yeah. Right in your heart. Right inside. And <clears throat> once I made that, I, I made this whole realization there. And it's, that's something I've actually intellectualized before and had discussions about, mm -hmm. but I never really accepted it. And I got to accept it. And once I accept that, I got to relive, like, from the beginning of time. I got to experience, evo like, biological evolution from, like, the amoeba to <laughs> a human. All right? And I come up to a point where I'm an Incan like 500 years ago and the Spaniards show up and I, I have like this experience where I'm like, it's like, I know in my mind, this is a Spaniard conquistador in my, in my mind, but in the Incan mind, I'm thinking this is a God. Mm. Quetzalcoatl has a ribbon. And, and then the conquistador stabs me and I die. And then when I die, I come back and I, I see Jesus Christ. And I see, I get to see him carry the cross and die on the cross. And it gets blurred between who's Jesus and who's me. Mm -hmm. And he feels sadness that like he tried to do something good, but he can't save everybody is the sadness. He dies. I die. I don't know. Then I become a Japanese warrior. And I'm in charge of this town. And I, when I come in and fully embrace this Japanese warrior, I'm in meditation in my room. And I have you know, my sword sheathed. <clears throat> and I get up from meditation and I just know that the enemy is coming. And I walk out and I talk to everybody in town. And I'm talking to all the warriors in town. And I'm like the leader. And I'm saying, hey, some of, some of us are going to die. You know, we're going to mourn your death, all that kind of stuff. You know, get prepared. They're coming. And moments after I speak, they do come. And they kill the entire town. And they walk up to me and they slit my throat. And I watch myself die. And I experience the sadness of not being enough. And my intent going in to that ceremony was to feel like I'm not enough. Because that's something I'd been struggling with was, was, trying, to, was trying to be enough mm -hmm. and, and constantly doing everything I can to be enough. And I got to realize that no matter what, I'm not going to be enough. And the worst, <clears throat> the worst iteration of, of not being enough is your entire culture being wiped out. Sure. And then you being wiped out and knowing that that's, that's gone. And, um, after that, I got some peace and, uh, 
You have to enjoy the music the rest of the night. Yeah. So I only had yeah, to die a few got... times to get there. But... <laughs> Ayahuasca has an amazing way of taking you through your deepest fears. And once you've seen and lived your deepest fears, like a horror movie that you've right. watched a hundred times, it's no longer going to make you jump. You're no longer scared mm -hmm. of those, those deepest, darkest fears. And all of those things that you experience, maybe it was you, maybe it wasn't, but it's part of the morphic right. field of all men. Like right. we've all... We carry that inside us. We carry us the triumphant warrior. We carry the oppressor. We carry the liberator. We carry the, you know, the failed warrior. We carry all of these things within us. And they're all archetypes for our own life that we experience over and over again. And yeah. ayahuasca will take you to the ones that scare the shit out of you the most mm -hmm. and yeah. say, are you okay with this? How about this? Are you okay with this? Oh, how about this? Are you okay with this? Yeah. Yeah. You know, right. until that you say like, you know what? I am okay with that. Yeah, I think I have like this passion for helping people and I want to help everybody. And sure. when I can't, it's heartbreaking. Sure. And I, I think, I think it's, I can accept that I will die not having helped everybody, but I'm going to still die doing it. And instead of looking at that as not enough, you look at that as enough. It's enough, and I've just got to pass the torch on when when it's time that's to it. pass it on. We've just got to do the next iteration. You do it. You do what you're capable of doing. Yeah. And that's and that's it. And you can do that. You can. That's living a life well lived, man. You know. And instead of bringing that judge in again and judging externally what is enough or what isn't enough, being satisfied with doing what you're capable of doing. Yeah, that was one of the big things I learned throughout the week. It, it actually took me days to process afterwards. I, bet. I mean, I'm still processing, right? I mean, it was just like I was on my, I was getting on my plane to come home, and I was talking to Doug about this. It's like, kind of realized that any judgment I feel from other people, I'm responsible for feeling that judgment. Mm -hmm. So that was a big release I've had over the last week. Is, is I used to like, oh, I don't give a fuck, right? That was my attitude, but that's like a workaround mm -hmm. around not accepting. Not, not allowing other people's judgment affect you at all. Mm -hmm. or, you know, not accepting that as judgment or perceived judgment. You know. Very cool, man. You did like the ayahuasca greatest hits. You like, <laughs> you like, you like skipped them. You skipped the middle albums that had a good song or two. And you just went for the fucking greatest hits. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's awesome, feels. man. Yeah. <laughs> Night two I, I, for I you. I had more of a one hit wonder. <laughs> like I had, I had a big experience. Yeah. One big experience. Oh, yeah. That was. I mean, the biggest experience that I've ever had, the most profound, most important thing that I've ever done. I, I and I firmly believe that. But he did. He had a lot more variety than I did. Like once I had that experience with my wife and my kid dying right in front of me, I was like, I did it. I'm done. That's like that's Great. all I fucking needed, and that, that's what I wanted my experience to be at that point. Mm -hmm. Like I didn't. I wasn't curious to have more. It was I want, the, completion, I that of, one it was the completion of a cycle, you know. And adding more to that at that point might have lessened the value of that first one and there's a crazy right. wisdom in these plants and that's yeah. why i inherently trust them way more like i've never done lsd i've done just about every other plant mm. because i did another psychedelic called 2cb which is a mm. it's a it was artificial like, i don't know it's some kind of chemical compound that they figured out and created okay. and for the very i had an interesting experience but i felt like i was in just a circus and I, i'm still to this day never figured out the meaning of everything that it was right and i so I'm just I just stay away from these other things because the plants, they have a spirit that's old. It really plants, seems like the plants carry more meaning. And they have sure. like a they have a way of knowing exactly what they need to give you. You know, when you surrender to them in the right way and the administrator is right and everything is clean, the plants, the head medicine spirit of these plants will give you exactly what you need, not more, not less. Mm -hmm. And give you the opportunity at least, because you still have free will, you can resist it or whatever. They'll give you the opportunity to get exactly what you need and whereas these other things like if you take lsd you're gonna go somewhere like it has to like it doesn't have the same and it could be beautiful or it could be not but it's not gonna like fucking pull the reins back you know you yeah. know i feel like the difference with ayahuasca is that there was there was someone there the whole time totally. who was the teacher yeah i was always in conversation the whole time i wasn't just having an experience like it, it was like i was i don't want to say i was in class but it was like i was i was amongst a mentor the mm -hmm. whole time there was someone guiding my experience with me and that that's never happened to me in any other with any other um you know san pedro or mushrooms or, right. or any other entheogen um just with ayahuasca and i think that's what makes it um so much more profound is that i i go in expecting to learn a lesson with ayahuasca 
where I don't necessarily go in expecting to learn a lesson with uh, with other experiences that I've had and in, maybe, in the same way anyway. And maybe part of it is you setting your intent with ayahuasca. I mean, I think a lot of these plants mm -hmm. have the ability, yeah. even marijuana, if you do it, especially eating it, like if you really set your intent, you know, a lot of these plants, the head medicine spirit of these plants will answer. Now, I think the yeah. best way it's been described to me is these plants are these massive coalesced forces in the astral beyond they're way too big to be manifest as a human. It's just too much too. Yeah. The wisdom is too old. The, they're like ascended masters, you know, so embodying themselves as a human and dying and doing this whole process doesn't make sense. So they come down into creation, into manifest as plants. Like that's the thing that's most suitable as these allies that are always there, steady, you know, wildly different and have many different facets, but that's the only way that it makes sense for them to come back into creation as allies. And when you take these plants, you get to interact with that force. And that for these forces are fucking awesome teachers. Yeah, definitely yeah. got that. Definitely got that feeling yeah. <laughs> throughout the throughout the whole thing. It was it was like there was there was a wisdom being passed on. Mm -hmm. I mean, the knowledge was in me, but the wisdom was in the plant. Well, the knowledge is in all of us because yeah. we have inside of us that we are source. We are God inside of us, and that yeah. was that lesson of that. It's like. Hey, I'm looking for God. Where are you? God? Oh, yeah. it's me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm you know, in I control. carry that inside, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And so, of course, you know, we have all of those, all of those answers within and without mm -hmm. us. The great mystery. Yeah. I do like the plant medicines always seem to help me zoom out and refocus on what's truly important in life. Mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> I never get caught up when I'm when I'm having experience on any of my external goals. Like I don't care if I win my next jujitsu tournament or or I hit my, you know, my my revenue numbers next month or or I, I move to a certain city. Like none of that shit seems to matter. It always refocuses me on how important people are in my life. Right. Like like in our business, I feel like it's uh, I feel like it's very much my job to make sure we hit our our numbers you know mm -hmm. revenue wise if we don't it hit is. our numbers then <laughs> <laughs> don't forget that shit that's right. your job motherfucker I, I, he doesn't get any more ayahuasca after this. <laughs> i'm like i don't really care about our revenue you're like whoa no more drugs for you i'm the only one that's not allowed to care about the revenue <laughs> <laughs> that's right so it, it's good that it helps me zoom out and realize that that Although that that certainly is important, you you need to have profit in your business, or you go out of business and then the fund's over. You gotta go get a job. Like sure. that's that's important. Uh, but just as just as oxygen to your body is the most important thing, if you don't get it, you're gonna die. It doesn't mean that that the purpose of living is to breathe. Right. Right. It's it's a necessity to do all the other things that are, um, you know, what makes life worth living. Um, you know, having awesome friends, you know, having a family, you know, mm -hmm. loving the people around you. And so I had, I had a good experience where um, I had the realization that in, even though I don't consider myself to be, you know, quote unquote, that wealthy, like I have more fucking money than some entire cities. And like that really hit me hard. Mm -hmm. and, and some of those people in those cities are probably way happier than me. Sure. And they have a millionth of what I do. In some cases, so even though money is is important and nobody would argue that, it's not what's important. Right. Right? Money is just energy. It's just energy that we yeah. store, and then it's stored to be released. It's stored to create. It's stored. I look at it like a battery, you know. And it's good to fill up the battery so you have power to do stuff. You can right. light up a fucking house. You can do these different things it's energy in a battery and the goal of that though is not to hoard it it's not right. to be like the great battery collector of all time you know, <laughs> like what the fuck is the purpose of that the purpose is to store the energy in the battery so you can use it directed so when some place is dark you can light it when someone is hungry you can feed it when you need to go somewhere and experience something you have the resources yeah. and the time to do it and that's people get all twisted about money and mm -hmm. i think you're absolutely right like I spent time in the Soweto slum in Kenya, which is one of the biggest slums in the world. Oh, yeah, I've seen it. And the kids there and the people there were way happier than this billionaire's birthday party I went to in Greenwich, Connecticut. Like, yeah. if you actually took, like, well, you're the, in the, surf <laughs> the surface <laughs> level of happiness of, like, hedge fund managers and, like, the, on the surface, everybody's happy. Yeah, they're eating right. shrimp and fucking John Bon Jovi's playing and whatever, but... The sadness is like palpable. Whereas mm. the other thing, there's suffering on the surface. Mm. Bellies are distended. 
but the happiness is what's underneath. So it's like this inverse where it's instead of this thin facade of happiness masking deep sadness, there's a thin layer of suffering, physical suffering, that that pain that you talked about, Mm -hmm. that's masking a real deep joy for life. And it's not that wealthy people are unhappy. It's just they have to have a healthy relationship with that and they have to cultivate their spiritual side and these other aspects, their family, spirituality, and just realize money is what it is. Yeah, it's a little slip, but it's a slippery, dangerous little trap where you think you're feeding your belly, but it's not food. You can't digest it. Yeah. You for know? for us in the business, it's you know money is is it comes, it comes and it goes. And for me, if especially yeah, especially if you're me, <laughs> it, it, it's really big swings if it's me. Yeah. <laughs> It'll come in a lot and it'll go out a lot. But uh, for me, if I just take care of the team, yeah. I just make sure that the team is living a fulfilled life. I, my primary goal is fulfillment, satisfaction, happiness, love. If these are things being experienced by the people on our team, then like financial success comes. And I, I think it'll... I'm confident that we would be more financially successful than we could have ever been focusing on the money, you know? So it's, uh, it's a real joy to me to know that my job is like, is to work on just the awakening of people on my team. That's, that's, awesome, it's, man. uh, it's the best job in the world. I feel the same way. Yeah. I feel the same way. Mm-hmm. Well, shit. That's awesome. Thanks for sharing your story. Thanks for having the courage to go down there and do the work. Thanks you know for having I mean? us on. Yeah, thank you. And it has this kind of magnifier effect because, you know, you get to go down, have your experience, tell the story, and then, you know, spark little seeds and plants. And for people listening, again, I can't stress enough, it's incredibly important to find the right shaman in yes. the right situation. Absolutely. And drink ayahuasca in response to a calling, not a curiosity or a fancy or this compulsion. You know, when you're called, then answer the call, but make sure you find, like, really top-level people because... You know, otherwise you can get, you know, kind of churned up a little bit you yeah, know, we, in these waters. We were walking around in Cusco and we find these shaman shops and there's these flyers, you know, for X amount of dollars. You can. Yeah. It's, don't, uh, don't do that for ayahuasca or tattoos. I'm like, I'm like, man, like <laughs> right. this is the vetting process is like yeah. this flyer. <laughs> yeah. You just sign up and you can show up next week. You know, we'll have yeah. a ceremony. I'm like, whoa. Friday's at seven. Yeah. <laughs> totally. yeah watch Happy out for hour. Right. When you see that shit, you should just look and envision a spider web and you're the fucking fly. Yeah. Because you're, you're going to find yourself in the web. And yeah, someone's gonna someone's gonna suck your blood. Yeah, uh, I, I think for us at some point, you know, we have we have a guy who he organizes these trips, mm-hmm. and so if you're interested, I, th- I know for us we're gonna set up something. Yeah, we don't know. We just got back, so we haven't really thought about logistics much. But we'll, we'll and maybe you are kind of doing the same thing. I don't know, but uh, we want. Yeah, set- I have a couple of centers that you know I I definitely recommend. I, I've been yeah. getting really acquainted with the, uh, the proprietor of the center called Blue Morpho, and I mm-hmm. really trust what he's able to bring and the people that he's working with. And that's probably who I'd recommend the most right now. Okay. But there's a couple other great practitioners, you know, Don Howard, mm-hmm. um, they have a great center down there to do it. But mm-hmm. the Blue Morpho way, they're tapped into something that I'm really, really keen on. Okay, um, It's a place of fearlessness and invincibility that they kind of tap you in and anchor to, oh, cool. which is really cool. It's a place where, you know, the snakes don't bite you and the thing. It's like it's like this this mindset that you can get in that really levels incredibly well with the medicine space. So I'm, I'm just kind of exploring that now, but that's for me, uh, the place that I would recommend, but there's a couple other good ones for sure. Yeah. We're, we're going to, you know, probably find a few resources and then at some yeah. point make it as we'll, well known as we possibly can. Yeah. As we'll, safely as we'll, possible. Pull, we'll pull our thoughts there and we'll, we'll yeah, provide some do. because there's a huge demand. And with that, there's going to become people who are going to take advantage of that. And so Absolutely. making sure that, mm-hmm. You know, you get with the right people is good. And there's new great shamans that are being developed. You know, I just met a, a shaman that just reached Maestro like a couple months ago and he was fucking badass. You yeah. know, and it's like it's cool to see the good shamans teaching other good shamans. I've also heard way. this is you want to you want to find a shaman uh, and stick with them for a while. You don't want to like stay shaman shopping forever. If you find a good one you know and that really works for you like you guys had amazing experiences you guys had like yes, you quintessential know. you know the ayahuasca experiences i'd stay 
yeah why why oh, yeah. risk why risk it <laughs> you yeah. know it's like <laughs> you know you may find that i'm by nature a, a seeker and explorer and i like experimenting with that right you know and i have i'm blessed with having a couple good options so yeah. i've kind of continued the, the quest but um, i'd say yeah if you find someone good and it's really resonating with you like it has with you guys mm -hmm. oh Stick yeah, yeah. we have nothing but good for, experience. for ayahuasca i think uh guy's name is uh javier uh riguero is that his last name mm -hmm. like that. riguero um but he uh he was awesome for ayahuasca but i, I am interested in trying uh sure. maybe don howard for the uh the Wachuma. It's something when you know you get these people who have these 30 year relationships with these plants, yeah. you know, every time it just goes a little deeper, it goes a little deeper, you know, get in there in the 3000 ceremony level. And they're like, they're buddies. They hang out with the plants. These like guys, it's like their homie. These guys go out for months at a time and they'll do the medicine like every other day. Yeah. And basically just eat enough food to keep them alive. So the, the guy that we worked with had, done uh five months before on dieta and mm -hmm. and it's basically every other day ayahuasca for five months talking with the plants and yeah if, if you don't know ayahuasca by the end of that i don't <laughs> know what intense. you can do <laughs> yeah for sure yeah. well that's awesome how can people keep up with you guys what's the what's the way they can follow you uh go to barbellshrug.com sign up for our newsletter and we're always blasting out new stuff and uh if you're an entrepreneur, we have uh, barbellbusiness.com uh, as well. Cool. And uh, yeah, we're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all that stuff. Doing the thing. If you find, if you just find Barbell Shrugged, it'll branch out and you can check out what we got going on. Beautiful. Thank you again, my friends. Looking Thank forward you. to hanging this Thank weekend. You, yeah. yeah. Peace. See awesome. everybody.